Hello, everyone. My name is Andrei Kuprianov, and this is a joint work with Daniel Tisdal. Hi, Dan. We both work at Informal Systems, and what we are going to tell you about is our work on correctness assurance for the Agoric Smart Contracts kernel. Uh, this, this project started as a security audit by Informal Systems of the Agoric uh, Smart Contracts uh, engine, and turned out into a long-term collaboration when we assure correctness of the system. In this talk, we are going first to tell you about what Agoric smart contracts are about. Then we will present different facets of what, how we approach uh, correctness assurance for the system. So we have constructed a TLA plus master model. We have verified garbage collection protocol that is used in the kernel of the system. And we have done model-based testing of intervat communication. So we, where we run tests generated from a TLA plus model against the real system. So Agoric smart contracts, uh, they're about uh, secure decentralized finance in JavaScript. JavaScript is one of the most popular uh, programming languages on the planet. That's why Agoric has chosen it for implementing its smart contracts. You may ask how secure is possible in JavaScript. Actually, Agoric researchers and engineers have done uh, an amazing job in securing JavaScript. So they have turned it into a secure environment, uh, which is based on the object capability model. An object capability is a transferable, unforgeable authorization to use some object. And all communication between, between different objects happens mediated and comes through the OCAP, uh, through, through the OCAP translation table that enforce OCAP discipline. And this prevents a completely certain kinds of attacks, such as Ethereum DAO, for example. Now this system is composed of multiple uh layers of the stack and it is it is based on the tender mint consensus engine and at the top of the stack there are some smart contracts uh, languages and protocols what we are analyzing lives in the middle of this system in particular it uh it is it is about secure um ecmascript and the, the object capabilities that are managed by, by the system. Here, JavaScript objects are administered by what's called live slots, which live in, in VATS, which communicate via Sphinx set kernel, and uh, the Sphinx set kernel man manages a Sphinx set machine. I will now tell you a bit more about different components of the system. So what, are this, what is this about? Objects are just normal JavaScript objects. Uh, they are submerged in this secure JavaScript environment, which is called SES. VATs are kind of processes in the system. They are a unit of synchrony. Inside the VAT, you can communicate synchronously, but every communication that comes outside of a VAT happens asynchronously and passes through certain translation tables that enforce object capabilities. Live slots is a layer underneath uh, the user space what called that translates uh, object references in the what into something that, that's externally visible to the kernel. A Sphinx set machine can contain multiple watts and it contains a shared kernel. And this shared kernel is very much like a Unix kernel which internally contains multiple tables for objects and promises and again, translation tables and a run queue of messages, how they are delivered from one uh, VAT to another VAT. Then uh, a call comes from a VAT to a kernel, it's called a syscall. And when it comes from a kernel to a VAT, it's called a dispatch. So we analyze uh, in, in our efforts, Specifically, all of these mechanisms that uh, how VATs communicate with each other through the kernel and how, how objects and promises are managed inside the kernel. Now, we turn into the presentation of the master TLA plus model. 
And if you look at the complexity of the system that we analyze, uh, it's, it's pretty complex. So it's more than 10,000 lines of JavaScript and more than 5,000 lines of Markdown. Uh, what we have done, we have uh, analyzed this, this system and modeled uh, the interactions between the watts and the kernel and how the kernel manages um, the objects and promises inside it. So our TLA plus kernel master model, it consists of sev several parts. Uh, first, we have type definitions. Then we have the master model where for each of the action protocol actions, we have a type, a precondition, a postcondition, and the change and change variables. We have the execution environment where we surround each protocol actions by, by certain usability improvements. And finally, we have model, mod, model tests. I will just walk you through each of those components so that you can see how this works. So for, for type depths, we heavily use Apalachi type system. In particular, it allows you to, to define type aliases. And to, for, for, for each, you, you see you can, you can specify what, what type each component of your system has. We, we use those type definitions um, in the main model file. Here, for in particular, all our variables are typed, right? So you, you can see, for example, that the run queue has a particular type, which is, which is defined here. It's a sequence of messages in, the, in that particular case. Then in the main model what we have we have we have those protocol actions and for each protocol action we define its precondition we define unchanged and changed variables and we define the effect of this of this action if we are talking about this action to create a watt the precondition says that the watt should not be known to the system and if if it's unknown that the update just adds this watt to certain kernel, kernel tables. This happens for all other kinds of, of protocol actions. Then in the execution environment, we define certain constants. So we, we define uh, how large our model can, can be. We define certain initializations. And finally, we surround each action with, with, with this, this kind of a boilerplate code, which can actually be generated automatically eventually. What we do here, we say, okay, we don't change variables that should not change. We save the action that is taken by the model. And then we check the precondition. If the precondition holds, then we execute the update. If the precondition doesn't hold, then we don't change the variables that are supposed to change and save, save the error. And eventually we existentially quantify all the input variables of this particular action. And this makes this action ready to be executed in the model. And then if you look in the at the model, then the next predicate looks, looks like that. So there is a certain order of, of actions that may happen in the kernel. So there are certain messages that may await execution. So we first execute those, those awaited actions. There may be a termination trigger set that will just say, okay, I, I just term, terminate this particular what? And otherwise we non-deterministically execute one of the protocol actions of the kernel. Finally, we have certain unit tests for the model that just check that the model behaves in the same way. In this particular case, we, we, we test the behavior under creating an unknown what or creating a known what. And what, what this allows us, it allows us in particular to trigger the type checking actions for, for our, our operators in the model. Uh, 
And then what we have found also very useful is type checking feature of the Appalachia model checker, which was introduced recently. What you see here, you see a particular commit uh, where I accidentally uh, mis mistyped uh, the, the operator name that I wanted to use. So instead of using this one, I should have used this, this one. What may happen if you have an ill-typed spec that your model checker model checking can can just go fine if you if you use untyped spec specifications. What happens in the case with TLC, for example? The question is, can you trust the result uh, of checking such specification? Luckily, Appalachia now has this type checking and it says you that okay, sorry, uh, your specification is ill-typed. So some something doesn't match here. And what doesn't match in this case is that if you assign this, this operator to this index in this table, like what to kernel, it maps what IDs to, to certain information about them. If you use this, this operator, then you, you map uh, a what ID to, to this one. So you map what ID again to what ID to what slot and to kernel slot. But as can be seen here, the type of this variable is actually that one, what to kernel, and it should be one, one, one level less, right? It should, it should map simply what ID to what slot and to kernel slot. So there is a typo here, and Appalachia type checker just catches for you this typo. Um, yes, now I give stage to Dan, who will tell you about verifying garbage collection protocols. Hi, um, in this part of the talk, I will discuss our model of the garbage collector protocol that is in the kernel and into the flat communication system. So we created a much more lightweight model than the master model. And um, it's quite an abstract model, which allows us to very practically verify um, some important invariants. So the swing set kernel contains a garbage collector protocol and it's needed to ensure that objects which are exported by VATS to other VATS are eventually cleared up when other VATS no longer need them. And it involves messages between the exporting VAT, so the one that sends the item or the object to another VAT, and the set of importing VATS. And all the messages are routed via the kernel. So the VATS store tracking data to keep track of the garbage collection um, protocol, and so does the kernel. And um, so our final model was very easy to model check. I'll uh, just give an overview of how the garbage collector works. So when an item is sent from one VAT to another, it creates several bookkeeping entries in the VAT, as well as the kernel. The exporting and importing VAT should store tracking data in their own processes, and the kernel stores its own reference in the key value store, as well as references in the um, translation tables for talking to the VATs. So the translation tables are needed so that each VAT can communicate with the kernel in its own language. Um, and the protocol starts to clear up an object when uh, an importing VAT tells the kernel that it no longer needs an object. And once all the importing VATs have done it, then the protocol should eventually free the relevant kernel data and also tell any remaining VATs who haven't cleaned up um, their tracking data that they can then drop the tracking data. So this diagram shows the kernel and an export and import of that. And the light bulbs show that um, the VATs know about the items, they have the tracking data, and also uh, the kernel data structures are all occupied. So there are six messages that are relevant to the GC protocol, uh, three syscalls and three dispatches. Uh, a syscall is made from a VAT into the kernel, and dispatches are made from the kernel to a VAT, as Andre said. Um, so a drop action announces that a strong reference can be downgraded to a weak reference, and the retire action announces that a strong or weak reference can be completely freed. Um, so the garbage collector is reference counted, and the reference count should be a function of the number of syscalls and dispatches done, um, but that function uh, is, not, is not always so straightforward. And um, so the final steps in the execution are the retire import and retire export dispatches. Uh, and that would, once those are fired, 
then that should signify the end of the lifetime lifetime of an object. Um, so something we would like to know is the effect of possible malicious code. And um, remember that uh, malicious code can um, can just be the result of bugs. So even if you just have um, buggy code, if it allows you know arbitrary code to run, then this can create a entry point for malicious code. So we want to check that an avat who imports an item um, and acts maliciously cannot cause problems for the other vats. Um, so we want to check that a vat cannot that a malicious vat cannot interfere by, for example, causing the kernel to drop an object too early or causing uh, an incorrect message to be sent to a correct fat. So in our model, we model three vats. Um, the model structure is quite simple. Uh, I won't show it all, but we start with an init step. And um, so the mode and step variables are just artifacts of the modeling. They don't have any meaning in the protocol, but they're useful for just guiding the logic of the model. Um, you'll notice that many of the variables are Booleans. And there's also two integers, which are the reference counts. And because we only model three vats, the reference counts are quite small. So uh, this helps to keep the state space small. Um, the logic of the model is shown on the right in the next uh, operator. And we can see there's three different modes, try DC action, try syscall, and handle kref. Uh, so this is you know, a dispatch step, a syscall step, and uh, some post-processing of maybe some additional GC logic. And um, in our model, once we kind of uh, inline the code, figure out, figured out what the code was doing, um, it was relatively easy to create the model. Um, and then we were able to uh, specify some invariants. So there's two kinds of invariants. There's one which is uh, not so, uh, so something we want to ensure happens. Um, so we want the, uh, the desired outcome of a lifetime of an object um, to eventually uh, get freed once um, you know once the correct initialization of the so once uh, once an object has been dropped, then it should eventually be you know completely freed from the system. Um, so we can find such an execution by using this invariant and uh, eventually free everything. And because we have negated this desired outcome, then when we find a uh, violation of this, then we have an execution which satisfies the behavior we're searching for. Um, and we could use temporal logic to express this, but using a simple invariant like this means we can also benefit from that Appalachian model checker, um, which can also generate multiple executions which satisfy this behavior um, in quite a user-friendly way. Um, pictured on the right is the eventual state we want to reach. Novat knows about the exported item, uh, so that's signified with the empty light bulbs. And also the kernel data structures are clear. So this is kind of the free state uh, at the end of the object lifetime. Um, we can also uh, specify some failure conditions, so things we want to avoid. So here on the left, there's an invariant exporter forgets early. Um, which we can see we have um, three variables, exporter state, exported remotable, and importer state. And what we want to check is that no exporting that drops an object before an importing one, because uh, an exported object can only be created once. So if an importer was able to access it and an exporter had dropped it already, then um, if an importer then referenced it in a message to the exporter, uh, it would not be able to handle message. Um, so we can see that this invariant is captured in an extremely small operator. And um, yeah, so this was quite uh, concise. Um, we have more invariants. So we also want to check that the kernel never frees an object too early. Um, so we want to check this situation. Uh, so in the right is pictured an, uh, an instance of the invariant in the left being violated. Uh, so we can see that the kernel object has been freed um, and the exporter still knows about the item because it has the lit light bulb. Um, an extra kind of 
um, variable that we use here is the reachable ref count. So this is also, um, you know, we want to check the case that the exporter and importer states are, um, even if they were correct, then we still want the ref count to be correct because the this might differ because the ref count is uh, on the kernel logic and the state is on the that logic. Uh, so we need to check for any discrepancy there. Um, we have another invariant which we check, which is we check for an unsafe free in the lookup tables, so the translation tables. And um, we can see here that on the right, the importer has forgotten about the object. Um, so it's actually fine that it has no translation table entry, but the exporter uh, still knows about the object because it has the lit light bulb. And it's, you can see that its uh, translation table entry has been deleted. So this is uh, an incorrect state, which we check for with this invariant. Uh, to summarize our modeling of the garbage collector, um, we, it was a very lightweight model and we easily checked it with TLC in a second. Um, there was less than 1200 states. And um, using this kind of like very abstract model, we were able to condense a protocol which was spread over roughly 4,000 lines of code. Um, so not to say that every line of that was relevant, but um, that was the kind of required amount of uh, code needed to be comprehended. Um, and now we have a model that's less than 200 lines of TLA+, plus, which gives a high degree of confidence in the protocol in the face of uh, different, difficult to reason about uh, interleavings of um, that messages and syscalls and dispatches. And um, one major advantage of this is now we have this spec and it's, it's a, you know, a semantically extremely precise description of the protocol. And it's uh, much easier and quicker to read than the documentation. So, yeah. So then I have I have a question here. I will, I will take advantage of me knowing the system a bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here you have manually constructed the the abstraction, right? Uh, how how would you see uh, like, like proving proving that the abstraction is actually fair? Compared compared to the to the system. Um, so I think there's there's always going to be uh, you know space for human error because at some point you have to make the translation from uh, source code or documentation into a model. Um, but you could use various techniques like refinement, for example, if you could uh, capture the substance of um, the system. Uh, in a very, even more abstract way than this, then using refinement, you could show that um, this model uh, refines that more abstract um, model. And hopefully by having an even more abstract model, it would be um, more clear that it represented the system accurately. And, um, you know, we could then uh, consult an expert. So for example, the author of the system and, um, if they could verify that link between the very abstract model and the system, then uh, using our refinement, we would know that this, um, you know, via induction, we uh, this more concrete model indeed uh, accurately represents the system. Um, so, yes, I mean, I mean, th th this goes into the direction of, of even more abstraction. But what I'm, what I'm. My meant is uh, going into the direction of the code, right? That this, ah, this model actually represents the code accurately. Right, that's right. So we could um, go the other way instead of making uh, making this a refinement of a more abstract model, we could make a more concrete model, which more closely resembled the code. And um, we would show that that model was a refinement of this model. Um, and that model could uh, be you know much richer in detail and actually model some code pathways more explicitly. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's one way you could you could do that. Okay. So um, switching gears now, I'll talk about another way that we've used TLA plus to help us check the agoric system. So we applied a technique called model-based testing, which uses a model to generate concrete tests for a system. 
Uh, so we created an abstract model of um, a different layer, so not the garbage collector and actually not the kernel itself, but um, actually the user space code and the interfect communication in the user space um, code. So yeah, so this is great because Appalachia allows you to generate uh, you know, thousands of executions that match specific uh, patterns of executions um, uh, in your model. So once we have generated hundreds of thousands of execution traces, we um, are able to convert them to concrete executions or tests using some glue code and run it directly in a JavaScript driver. Um, so we can kind of bridge that gap from the model to actually checking the running uh, code. So first of all, I'll just give an idea of the user space. So uh, the Agoric system is quite powerful in the sense that uh, user space code um, is, can run, uh, contain almost arbitrary JavaScript um, with the additional power that multiple, that uh, two vats can send objects uh, to each other. And um, yeah, so using this OCAP system. Um, here are some snippets, for example, um, that A can call method foo on that, uh, an object sent by that B, um, you know, with an object containing um, many, many different JavaScript types, including promises, functions, closures, and of course, just uh, data types too. Um, so this, having so much freedom and such a powerful user space, uh, you know, you can do so much. It gives rise to the question of how can you write meaningful, meaningful tests? Um, so that was the challenge here. So we went about this by decomposing the possible behaviors into combinations of small building blocks. And um, we also modeled two or three VATs. So uh, yeah. Instead of modeling the memory of each VAT separately, we model a shared universe that the VATs can interact with. So just a shared array of items that can be um, sent between the VATs and you know, have methods called on them and so on. Um, and you can imagine the zero state as being the empty universe, so shown by this empty shared array. As uh, the model execution progresses, that's may non-deterministically add items to the universe or interact with existing items. So the bats do not all have access to every item unless they're given access by a VAT with access or they create the item themselves. Um, so in this uh, diagram, that's A and B have created references to themselves and um, stored them. And you'll notice that that A uh, drawn with the dotted line is the only person, is the only VAT with access to its own reference. Whereas that B and that C both have access to the reference um, VB. So perhaps that B uh, provided access to that C. So it actually sent it the item. Um, we model not only references, but also promises and their resolver functions. Um, so in this configuration, the universe contains two VAT references, VA and BB, as well as two promises in the resolvers, P0 and R0, and P1 and R1. Um, so note that VAT A can access a resolver function for promise 1. It can access R1, even though it cannot see promise 1. So perhaps um, some previous steps happened and you know some items uh, were sent between various VATs. And it's possible in this configuration then in, in the subsequent step for VAT A to resolve promise one using the resolver R1 uh, to another item that it has access to. So in this case, it could resolve it to VA. And if that happened, we can see a transition here. So VAT C, which um, has access to P1, so to the promise, uh, once it was resolved, would then be able to see the item that it was resolved to. Uh, so in, in the actual system, this is, uh, these, pro these uh, steps, you know, uh, ex uh, exercise a lot of code. And um, by composing the steps in this way, we can uh, model some quite uh, sophisticated executions. So uh, coming to the model and the our testing system. In total, we modeled six building block steps and 
Um, yeah, we also wrote some glue code that can take a trace, uh, so a behavior of the model, and generate a script, which can be run in a JavaScript, JavaScript driver, uh, which you see a snippet of on the right. So we have six steps in total, send item, drop item, um, store a self-reference, store a promise and its resolver, and resolve a promise using a resolver to a third item. Um, there's also like a auxiliary step transfer control, which is um, we needed it in the model to, um, to know when we could switch uh, which fat was executing at which time. And um, each of these maps directly to uh, instruction in the JavaScript driver. And um, so we also have some glue code to bridge this gap. So to convert the abstract model execution into uh, a concrete script, which the JavaScript code can run, which uses like uh, item IDs um, specific to the VAT. Because of course, we're going from this shared universe into uh, local per that memory. Um, yeah. So we can generate then executions, multiple executions for a behavior uh, or a pattern that we want to see using Appalachian. And, um, you know, Appalachian provides three components which make this really effective. So Appalachian does not support uh, generic temporal operators, but it does provide what's called a historical trace, which I'll show you shortly. Um, that's a trace over a sequence of states. And it does allow you to generate multiple executions for a um, violated invariant. Uh, so you can enumerate as many as you like. And uh, it also provides the feature to define a view operator, which is a projection uh, that allows you to control the kind of counterexamples or uh, traces which are generated. Um, so for example, one pattern that we specified is um, using this operator. So trace results from a seen by other is, um, so this operator takes a sequence of states, which you can see with, again with this type annotation, um, and it's a predicate over that. So we defined a utility operator and then we actually specify this uh, behavior we want to see. So this behavior is looking for um, two indexes in the sequence of states, so the history, in which um, state um, i, or the transition from state i to i plus one is a promise resolution step. And um, state j, which uh, succeeds i, um, does not, have the same acting VAT as state uh, step I. So that can be seen in um, where it says acting VAT is different in states I plus one and J. Um, and then there's a check to check that we, uh, that step made by in step J is not just a, uh, you know, um, auxiliary step. So we want actually a meaningful step there. Um, so many of the behaviors we generate here, um, well, all of them will include a promise resolution, and many of them will include a, not only is the promise resolved, but also uh, a different VAT is able to then uh, use the resolved promise uh, for a subsequent step. So it's quite an interesting behavior, um, which we can specify like this and generate thousands of counterexamples for. Um, Appalachia also provides a view, so it's a um, it's a function of the state, which um, Appalachia says it uses to determine if two if it should consider two states to be different when it generates counterexamples. So here, um, one we used was exploratory view, and um, so it's a function of the step count and step variables which are the kind of actions chosen. And so what this is saying is, uh, Appalachia will say states A and B are different if the step variable is different. And one of the steps has a step count of four or more. So what this allows is, um, because Appalachia will only generate counterexamples which are different according to this, then we ensure that each counterexample uses a different sequence of steps in the suffix of this step sequence. Um, whereas, 
you know, the prefix might actually, uh, it can be the same because you won't be able to differentiate in that case. So okay. this means that... Then, then I, have, I have a question here. You have used both the Palachi and TLC for generating multiple counter examples, right? Right, right. How, how would you compare like, like the, the abilities in that respect? Um, so I would say Appalachian is much uh, more feature rich in that respect. Um, well, TLC, it provides uh, a continue parameter. So um, it allows you to essentially say that you want to uh, continue model checking when an invariant is violated, but you have very little control over how that happens. Uh, so you're kind of at the mercy of the, um, well, like the BFS algorithm essentially. And um, you may generate many uh, counterexamples which are not meaningful um, because you can't, you don't have this view. Um, so TLC does give a view um, feature, but it actually has different semantics from this. So it's not relevant in this case. Um, also TLC has the added issue that you could uh, accidentally cause the model to run forever. Um, whereas Appalachian is a bounded model checker and um, will check, uh, We'll check like the diameter um, per diameter of your execution. Um, so uh, for for this model based testing, uh, Appalachian is uh, crucial right now. Okay, thanks. Um, so to summarize, I'll just kind of describe the effort to reward ratio of this MBT approach. So uh, we needed two hundred lines of JavaScript code to actually run the script. Around three hundred lines of glue code to translate uh, executions into um, a script for the JavaScript. And we needed about 200 lines of TLA plus for the model. Um, once we have defined like a operator for to match a pattern of behavior, um, depending on the complexity of it, we were able to generate uh, one trace uh, every, like from every second to a few seconds up to like a couple of minutes. Um, so using this approach, you can generate thousands of tests for a given behavior. The behaviors can be as simple or as complex as you wish, um, depending kind of on your, how long you want to wait, essentially. And, um, you know, you can, the real advantage is you can uh, generate tests for a complex runtime environment uh, using a very abstract model. And it's um, kind of depends on uh, just the nature of the model and um, how much uh, gluing you want to do just to generate any auxiliary um, you know, parameters that are needed in the real runtime. And um, you know, this is really useful because it can be, the test can be easily incorporated into a CI or regression suite. Um, you can just you know, accumulate many, many tests for many different things and um, you know, just uh, explore a huge number of pathways in the code um, with relatively little effort. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so thank you um, very much for listening. And um, yeah, I, maybe Andre would like to say something too. Yes, thank, thank you for listening to our talk. Uh, please check out here are some references for you uh, to check. And in, in general, we are very much happy to, to, to be involved in, in projects around correctness insurance and in particular this TLA plus. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, the question I have is kind of more of an organizational thing. So what's like the relationship between, I guess, informal systems and Agoric? Like, was this a, a consulting thing? Was it like, are you somehow involved in the development of it or, yeah? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. We are completely independent entities. So in, at Informal, we do have like an engineering division that de develops for Cosmos, uh, but we also have a copy division correctness assurance team that, that does like research and model checking and, and security audits. And we were involved with Agoric in the security audit and like they were like, like, like the results, so we, we in engaging in a long-term collaboration. So we are completely independent. But yeah, we could collaborate. Appalachian, is it uh, really set up to nicely support the model-based testing 
workflow? It is Hello, so in My name is testing, sorry. Uh, we, we support both Apalachi and TLC, so we can use both of them. Um, Apalachi has some unique features, TLC has some other unique features. They are in, incomparable, actually. Like for some tasks, one is better for the other, or another is better. Uh, Apalachi has some, some nice features about like this view abstraction and others. So, yeah. And we are, we are also you know, actively developing it because it's like an in house tool. So you can influence the development. That's, that's nice. Okay, then I want to go to the chat. And there were a few questions in the, in the uh, Slack. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. Um, so the first question is given the disparity between the size of the code and the model, how assured are you that the code is faithful to the model? Yes, thanks for the question. I think the main, the main uh, line for us to, to ensure the, this link between the code and the spec is model-based testing. So this really makes makes the specifications live and like such that they don't don't diverge one one from another. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question: How many bugs have been found in the code? Have all bugs been fixed? Um, and is the customer going to adopt TLA Plus as a design tool, or just read specs to use them as docs? Um, and then follow up, is the customer going to evolve the specs? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a question with many facets, thanks. So, so in that particular case, uh, in the Agoric case, uh, Dan and I were sure that we will find some bugs because the code is pretty complex. We haven't found any, actually. Uh, we, we have introduced artificial bugs just to be sure that the approach is working and it like, it, catched all of them in, in seconds. So it is working. Uh, we are applying the same approach with, with other like companies, uh, and it does catch a quite substantial number of bugs, like, like real bugs. Um, yes, is a customer going to adopt a the design tool? Um, so what, what we are going to do with Agoric now, it's uh, our tests are going to be interpreted into the ACI, and the model is going to be evolved in, in many directions. So like we are going to build further model models and can connect them to the code and between each other via, via refinements. Um, yes, so we have like a long term plan for, for years to come because the system is very complex. <coughs> All right, um, I know we're slightly over. Um, let's see. Since you prefer a typed variant of TLA plus to catch silly, ex silly expression, expressions before model checking, what is the long-term plan with regard to type annotation versus automatic automated type inference? Why wouldn't I rather choose, e.g., for example, Spectacle, which replicates TLA plus in Haskell, to make types of first class concepts in TLA plus? Thank you for the question. It's also a very interesting one and also very multifaceted. Um, so I, I think what, what, what we are going to do, so I, uh, I shouldn't answer because this is more on the Apalachi team and we are more on the model, model based testing team, but uh, it's going, the Apalachi is going to evolve like TLA plus by adding a bit more more features, like evolving this type type annotations, and um, yes, it's it's so what what we are going to develop is like things around TLA plus, like like for example, a VS Code plugin which would use Apalachi and Apalachi type inference integrated into VS Code and like choose spectacle with TLA plus compared, compared to TLA plus this. It's, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of taste more or less, right? Uh, spec, spec, spectacle is a, is a different, different language. Some people may, may, may like TLA plus more, some may like spectacle more. 
no, no matter you what what approach you use, the most important thing is that you use a form, formal model, a for, for formal methods to and apply them to your code. I think that's much more important. So I would, I would also add there, um, as far as I know, Spectacle is an explicit state model checker. So similar to TLC in that respect, whereas Appalachia is a completely different, based on a completely different algorithm. Uh, it's a symbolic model checker. So um, yeah, it's comparing apples and oranges there. You can also generate executions as input for model-based testing with TLC. When would I use Appalachia when TLC? What is, what is the length of the executions you are generating? Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so it really depends on the model. Like, for example, the model that, that, that Dan constructed for, for garbage collection or for interval communication, they were so much simplified that they were like really finite space, like, like a thousand of states, right? TLC is just perfect in that case because it can generate traces very quickly and a large number of them. For other models uh, where you can't actually so easily enumerate states, it's just better to use Apalachi because it's symbolic. And, you know, it, it can still work while, while TLC would, would keep enumerating without, without a bound. Um, yeah, it depends on the system. Maybe then can can add something here. Um, yeah, so uh, um, it, it, de it depends on the model and the, the sh kind of like the shape of the state space, so, um, especially for infinite state space um, models, then um, as Andre says, Appalachia is uh, quite an advantage because um, TLC can, is likely, for example, if you have integer variables with large ranges, TLC as it is currently, will um, you know just generate you a counterexample, possibly for every single integer value, even if that's uh, not relevant to your purpose. Um, whereas Appalachia, by providing this view operator, you um, as well as the historical trace, you can kind of um, it's kind of a way of telling Appalachia uh, what kind of uh, counter examples you want to see, so that you can you know they're um, going to be uh, useful for sure, and you won't have um, many counter examples which are similar, um, too similar to be really um, useful. Yeah. Maybe if I may ask a follow up question, um, it sounds you're not using a TLC simulation mode, but breadth first search mode. Uh, so why don't you use simulation mode to generate longer traces in an instance of a second, since you're not going after exhaustive search anyway? Then, so that's that's something we could try actually. Um, I'm not sure. Um, so that's actually some like a quite a good point where um, we can look into that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. We are, yeah. we, are, we are not yet aware of all possible use cases for TLC, so maybe we are not using it always like, in the best possible way. So then, then so the simulation the mode also take advantage of multiple threads? I assume it does. Um, I wouldn't see why not. Well, so if that's um, interesting for you, maybe we just follow this up offline. Um, yeah, we can talk and I can show you the simulation mode. Okay, great. Uh, do we have more questions here? No, looking around. I think we're done. So thanks again to the speakers. Thank you. And